please. I'll kill myself. You can't say that to me. How is my life worth so little to you? No, 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 absolutely not. I've got it. I've got uh, it. Oh, please. Franklin, our money's no good here. He, he was stalking me. What makes you say that? I'm scaring you. Yeah, you are. You're scaring me.
What's in the basket? Let's get him up. Mrs. Mulder. <laughs> uh, only thing, sorry, I have to say it. Uh, ladies, do watch what you flush. You can't hide. Go on. I bet you're good at it. And I'm good at seeking. I'm just not in the mood to play a game right now. Sorry. You're leaving? Are these the questions you ask? Fuck off! That's so... You want to divorce so me more than crazy. you want to... Why aren't you replying? What? What the fuck are you? What? James. What is it?
is it that you want from me? You hear? Seems to me like they might have got me. So, I haven't really talked about the politics of this movie, and I don't much intend to. Uh, there's a lot you can learn from why this movie is the way it is by looking at it politically. You know, all of the men are played by the same actor to dramatize this sense of being a woman in a strange new place where every new man you meet is... A, at least a potential attacker or misogynist and you just never really know what is lurking underneath the smile, right? They're all just sort of equally threatening when you don't know anyone, uh, especially. The final birth monster could be seen as like this symbol of toxic masculinity. You know how I didn't say masculinity like all masculinity, just toxic masculinity. I made a point to put an extra word in front of Get out of my comments. You know who you are. <laughs> um, you know, maybe it's it's about how each of these different men uh, kind of exists, who all exist on this, like, spectrum of misogyny from, like, worst to least worst. How, like, all that stems from the same rotten root. Maybe this image of seeing these men, like, entwined together in agonizing birth pains is about how like sexism saps the power and dignity of men as well as if not as much as women you know they're doomed to only give birth to this self-absorbed sense of victimhood their muling entitlement to the attention and affection of women being like the thing that keeps them alone with only like other miserable men to keep them company right maybe it's all of these things maybe it's none of these things maybe it's all of these things and none of these things again and again i find myself more interested in the aesthetics of this movie 
that's why I spent so much time talking about Harper's walk in the woods, or specifically like the technical decisions that went into it, because I feel like to discuss a work of art's aesthetics is to get at least an imperfect glimpse at the inner workings of its poetry. And I do think that Men is a movie where the poetry outweighs the theme. I don't think its top priority is to like be this kind of feminist lecture that we've all heard some version of a million times before, even within horror, maybe especially within horror. I mean, God, I feel like the default horror story is that of like some woman being terrorized by some crazy man, right? It's not some new idea we've just come, like, discovered in the Me Too era. So, why tell that story in this way? Why, for example, is there this moment where, you know, after Harper stabs the vicar, th there's like five different shots of her running out of the same doorway in different ways, right? Like, there's this steady aesthetic infection of the narrative that, uh, like, at a certain point, the hows and whys of everything kind of just goes out the window, and we are left with pure experience, which kind of defies easy classification which is something that this director has done before. Uh, Alex Garland's last movie, Annihilation, has a very similar trajectory where the world is being aesthetically infected by the shimmer. Quite literally, it's a giant rainbow haze that's threatening to swallow the whole planet, right? The first woman is physically destroyed, the second woman is mentally destroyed, and the third and fourth are aesthetically destroyed. They are absorbed into the Shimmer's poetic visual language. The finale in The Lighthouse is an abstract climax of pure music and movement. It's this moment that the movie has sort of been poetically hypnotizing us into for its entire runtime. Narratively, Lena annihilates herself here, but this is also a moment of, I think, aesthetic annihilation for the audience, a total surrender to the poetry of this moment's music, dance, and color. And, you know, of course, like, on some level, men wants us to grapple with its politics. The fucking thing is called men, right? But I just... To me, even more so than annihilation, men feels like a poem more than a story. And I use the term poetry kind of broadly in this video, like, I mean everything from, like, music and movies to... Really, really all art, I think, has some element of poetry to it, in the sense that all art concerns itself with finding connections between language, images, sounds, and, uh, ideas in, you know, un unexpected ways. Um, but as a critic, it puts me in kind of a weird place. Because I think it's kind of a cop-out to just say, oh, you know, this work of art is poet. It's, it's, poet. it's poetry. So you can't criticize it. Like, that begs the question, what makes a poem good? What is the value of poetry? So, what I think I'm going to do for the rest of this video... Um, we're going to take a little detour from men. We're going to take a look at three of my favorite poems and really quickly talk a little bit about what I think is great about them. And maybe in the back of your mind you can be thinking about men as we talk about this. And then we'll get back to the movie. All right? Cool. On the City Street. They meet in the pink dust of the city street. He raises his gold crop high in salute. Ladies, says he, where do you live? There are 10,000 houses among the drooping willow trees. I love this poem. 
I perfectly understand it, and I don't understand it at all. I'm given enough that I never feel totally lost. Two people meet on a street, the guy asks a question, and she answers it. Easy to follow in that sense, but I don't know why the dust is pink. It evokes the pinks of sunset to me. But it could just be a whimsical world of pink dust, or maybe the dust is pink with blood. The unnamed guy has a gold crop that he's saluting her with, asking where she lives. Is he a conqueror inviting himself to her house, or is he a nobleman chivalrously asking a sweetheart for a date? There are 10,000 houses among the drooping willow trees. Is she saying you'll never find me, or is she saying my essence can be found everywhere? Is it a warning or a comfort? Spending more time with the poem only complicates it. Every new image adds more meaning in a slippery way that you can sort of feel on your fingertips without quite being able to put it into words. The pleasure of poetry is in moving from moment to moment, peering into the infinities behind simplicity. Ode to the Maggot Brother of the blowfly and godhead, you work magic over battlefields, in slabs of bad pork and flop houses. Yes, you go to the root of all things. You are sound and mathematical. Jesus Christ, you're merciless with the truth. Ontological and lustrous, you cast spells on beggars and kings behind the stone door of Caesar's tomb, or split trench in a field of ragweed. No decree or creed can outlaw you as you take every living thing apart. Little master of earth, no one gets to heaven without going through you first. So here's a poem that isn't a story, but an act of observation. The narrator looks at something that we tend to think of as weak and disgusting and finds power and majesty. Nothing is happening in it, but simply by the act of really looking at a maggot, we find so much to discover. This is a bit less perplexing than the Lee Poe poem, but simply by taking something we thought we knew and making it unfamiliar, there's a similar sense of mystery. The pleasure of poetry is in the way it trains us to observe deeply, to see beauty, truth, complexity, and connection in everything. The Rose Family the rose is a rose, and was always a rose. But the theory now goes that the apple's a rose, and the pear is, and so's the plum, I suppose. The deer only knows what will next prove a rose. You, of course, are a rose, but we're always a rose. I like how this poem deconstructs what a rose can and can't be in a sort of nonsensical way. It frolics in barefoot defiance of the need for any one easy definition for a rose, gleefully mocking the function of language even as it celebrates language's sensuality, the way it stimulates the throat, mouth, and tongue to make rhymes and rhythms. The pleasure of poetry is in the way meaning is often defeated by rhythm and sensation. I think there's something really spiritually important about the way that poetry values experience over understanding. Poetry is no less than a hijacking of how our brains naturally want to work. Language itself is an act of abstraction. This is wood and lead. It is the corpse of a tree. It is a tool, a weapon, something I chew on when I'm anxiously contemplating a script. I could describe this for another 30 minutes, but I still would never be able to fully encapsulate everything that this is or could be, but for practicality's sake, my brain just calls it pencil. A poem destroys that abstraction. A poem makes things unfamiliar again so that the brain can't just label it and move on. A poem about this pencil might just Describe the baby burrs that used to live on the tree that this pencil used to be a part of. It might refer to my teeth marks as anxious hickeys. Then it might, I don't know, like uh, end by playing around with how writing for a pencil is kind of like speaking or something. You know, maybe something like this. Newborn chicks once cheap to top my back. Lonely I wait for the writer's teeth, anxious hickeys. Granite hissing, shrinking like a cigarette. 
my speech unspools from pressure. You know, I wrote that in 15 minutes. I don't know how good it is or isn't, but you can see how instead of everything in this poem all converging on pencil as the meaning of the poem, pencil is simply a starting point for each line of the poem to go in completely different directions, unified only by a shared pursuit of beauty. Why aren't you what? What the fuck? What? What is it that you want from me? You're so mean. You wouldn't even play a game of hide and seek. You are singing to me. <laughs> what is it that you want from me? Your love. What are you doing here? What is it that you want from me? Your love.
Thanks for watching Acolytes of Horror, where we examine the horrors of life through the horrors of film. Shout out to Matthew Zapruder's book, Why Poetry, and Mary Oliver's A Poetry Handbook, both of which really shaped a lot of my thoughts on poetry. They're really good reads. Um, I make a bonus video for Patreon patrons every single month. I recently did some stuff on Nope, Barbarian, and Midnight Mass, so check that out if you think it sounds interesting to you, or if you just want to support the work that I do. I uh, hope to see you there, or if not, right here, next time I make a video, whenever that'll be. See you next time.